Welcome to Reverse Engineering News. I'm your host, Hash. Thanks for joining. This week, we're going to take a look at your right to repair, or better yet, your lack of right to repair. We're also going to look at reverse engineering an air data computer that was used in the 1950s. Take a trip down Retro Lane by looking at a vintage computer blog, and I got a short film uh, recommendation for you. Also, this video is filmed in HDR. If you are uh, watching on an HDR capable device, I should be a uh, should be looking even crispier than usual. Now, if you don't know, Richesum has a Patreon channel. Over there, you can check out longer versions of this content with more technical details and other tidbits I include in there. It's ad free, and there's also detailed steps to reproduce things that I do in the other videos here. Check it out. Now, let's chat about reverse engineering to repair. So, a German company called Notebook Nerds made a tool to repair Apple MacBook computers. So apparently on these Macs, there's a sensor that detects when the screen is closed. And that sensor fails sometimes due to water damage or whatever. And until recently, it was impossible for any repair groups to actually replace this part because you had to have some special access to program it. This little sensor that's like a Hall effect sensor apparently is more than that. And it's not just on off. It has to actually be calibrated and only Apple could do that, of course. Well, they made a device called a Nerd Tool 1 that you plug this little sensor into and you press a couple buttons and it calibrates it and then it loads those settings into it and then it works. They had to reverse engineer how to talk to this sensor. It's not published as of yet. They might publish it in the future. Um, but they sell this device so repair shops can repair Apple computers. Now, this is like a software-induced plague, I want to say. So this didn't exist for mechanical devices and even electronics only devices, I will say, in the past. If you look at those mechanical devices, well, they'd come with exploded diagrams or even devices would come with schematics so you could repair them. It's only once software was introduced that really this right to repair, this ability to access things became very gated. And this is great for companies. They love gating this because it means that you're locked into buying things from them and you're locked into going to them for any help that you might need. I kind of think of it as the software is used to enslave us to these devices. And it's unfortunate that things like the DMCA and, and these other things exist. That means that it's really hard to touch it without fear of litigation. That same fear doesn't exist for looking at circuit boards or taking pictures and sharing them online or taking pictures of a, a mechanical device. I could take a watch apart and show you all of how it works and post pictures online. But if there was a chip in there running some software, well, I can't actually take that software out and show it to you, even though it's basically the same as all of these mechanical components or electrical components. We're limited and manufacturers love that limitation. I feel it's a lot like the auto repair industry and these others. I mean, farm equipment faces it. It's a pendulum that swings. It swings one way where it goes into the, the direction of the consumer, where we have the ability to fix and work on things. And that generally means that the company isn't making as much money as they could, whichever company this might be. And so they do things to swing the pendulum back in the other direction. And that pendulum swing this time is software. Software swung it back to the point where we can't do anything with this stuff now and we're beholden to these manufacturers to ask them, please, can we work on your things? Please, can we fix them? Now, the scariest thing to me is when you see companies like Apple jump on the bandwagon of repairability and say, okay, yeah, now we're all for a uh, right to repair now. That's pretty scary. Uh, in full disclosure, I got a Mac computer, I got an iPhone, I got an iPad, like I like Apple gear. But I know how these companies think. If they're jumping on the bandwagon of right to repair, it's because they see a way of potentially derailing or delaying any real change for a very long time. So they're going to kind of say, hey, we're all for it and everything else. And how many years will that buy them to continue with the current business practices? That's really all that is. You know, the, the reality is internally, they're probably fighting it tooth and nail. And it would be, honestly, more 
<laughs> like I'd, I'd believe it more if they were still just fighting it because that is the true nature of it. Once they swing this other way, I know now it's a delay type of strategy. The same way smoking companies delayed any changes or laws passed on the marketing or anything else. Like they, they jump on board, they make it look like they're part of the team and really they're, they're working against you the, the whole way. Now let's switch gears a little bit and talk about reverse engineering an air data computer. So Ken Sharif on the Rido blog, he does a bunch of good reverse engineering stuff. I've talked about him before. Uh, he's basically looking at this 1950s mechanical computer. So the whole thing's mechanical. Like there's no like real kind of uh, electronics computation in it. All the computation, all the math is literally done with gears, cam, uh, cam lobes. I mean, it's, it's crazy. And, and we're not talking like simple math. Like we're talking addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, uh, nonlinear stuff like squares. I mean, all kinds of calculations and it's using nothing other than these gears and cams and, and other things. And the reason that they had to make this computer in the 1950s was they had a jet that they had developed and it was approaching the speed of sound. And so to calculate airspeed, when you're going that fast, you can't just do the same stuff that you would do like in a little Cessna that's flying around where you're kind of measuring the differential in, in air pressure externally and internally. They talk about it on this blog write-up. You have to do a lot of other stuff as you approach the speed of sound. And so they had to develop this whole computer. And what's crazy when you look at this thing, like like just look at uh, look at this this formula. They're doing that with gears and and cam lobes, math, like crazy math, you know, real time. As this data is flowing in, it's performing this function and it's sending out the answer. And it's doing all with synchros, which are also a really cool thing to read about, um, you know, in, in the 50s. Now, look at, look at this device. They didn't have CAD software. Like if I ask you to design this and, okay, go Fusion 360 and, Use your computer to run all kinds of calculations, and you probably have a calculator. So you can use a calculator. This is the 1950s we're talking about here. Uh, I don't even know. Did they have calculators? I don't even know if uh, the portable calculator was invented when they were designing this thing. They might be doing the slide rules and, and you know, I mean, old stuff, rulers and paper is how they're designing this. That's crazy in itself that they made this mechanism. And then... So as Ken Schrift's taking it apart, he's talking about it on his blog, he was kind of worried because there's a portion that's these just tons of gears and everything else. And then there's a whole back portion to it with some other things, the synchros, these other stuff that are going to carry the data out. He's like, okay, how am I going to take this apart? Well, surprise, surprise, they designed it for repairability. So you can actually separate the gear portions of this thing from the synchro portions to work on it. I mean, even opening it up, like it's sealed, but you watch them, they use a blowtorch to actually melt the solder, essentially like they kind of let it closed or whatever, to peel this thing off and then take the case off of it. I mean, it was meant to be worked on. That's how things were. They were meant to be worked on. It's a no-brainer with a mechanical device that you're going to work on. And nobody thought, oh, I'll design a mechanical thing and then I'll seal it for all eternity and make it so no one can touch it. That's a very new concept. Everything, you know, in history has been designed this way. And so it was real interesting as I was reading down the blog to see his surprise that even it could be removed and that he could work on it and take it apart. I highly suggest you take a look and, and read this blog. I mean, it's amazing to see just how he reverse engineered this thing and how they did all these math functions and everything else with literal gears and cogs and, and rotation. Uh, you know, in cams to perform complex functions that they would literally grind the shape of the cam, which would define what the function was. It's crazy. Now let's take a trip down retro lane. There's a blog. It's called Leaded Solder, which is a great name for a blog by a guy named Mike. On that blog, if you go to the about page, there's just a list of a ton of old computers. They're awesome. I mean, there's just a bunch of them. Every computer, probably when you were a kid, whatever it is you had from long ago that was your first computer, would probably be on here if it was a vintage style computer. I had a Sinclair ZX81. They didn't have that exact one, 
but they had a Sinclair 1000. It's about the same form factor, and scrolling through all the pictures, it reminded me of exactly trying to make that computer work in my bedroom on the floor with a little tiny black and white TV. Uh, it's awesome to see all the work that uh, he kind of goes through in restoring it. And he takes a bunch of great pictures of the insides. You really get a feeling of like you're there taking them apart too and taking a, a look at them. He has the classic TRS-80, the Trash-80. I think that one literally was a Trash-80 on his site. He might have found in the trash can or something else. And he shows running through it and all the all the images of opening it up and all the kind of how it deteriorates over time and foam that gets cleaned out and these other things. It's fun just to take a look at these very old devices with very large parts that were very approachable, you could say. It's from a, from a time when repair was obvious and things were designed to easily be worked on and modified and repaired and the very opposite of where we are today. Now, let me tell you about a short film called The Hacktivist. Now it's about the adventures of hacking the Xbox, a run-in with Microsoft, and the right to repair and modify devices. I mean, that seems to be the, the theme for this week's show. I didn't plan it that way, but as I kept digging, this just what popped up this week. Uh, it features Andrew Huang, Bunny, obviously, from Hacking the Xbox, and Sean Cross, who goes by Zobs. Now it came out like a year ago, but somehow, I didn't hear about this thing at all, and I never watched it. YouTube suggested it, and it didn't even mention any of that stuff, so luckily I clicked and watched it. Uh, and if you care at all about right to repair that's interesting to you, I think you're really going to like that video. Now, if you made it this far, well then, make sure you're subscribed, hit the thumbs up button, and ding the bell. You can find me on Twitter and TikTok, all the other social media sites. The links are down in the description. And check out the Richesum Reverse Engineering Wiki. There's been some awesome things that were added just in the last week. If you go to the Software Reverse Engineering Tools page, you'll see that Polymorphic 7 populated the heck out of that thing with like every kind of different tool that can be used for software reverse engineering. It's all organized. It looks great. If you're wondering what could I do for this or that, you gotta check that page out. It looks awesome. And if you see something that's missing, let us know in the Discord channel or create an account and add it yourself. There's also some cool camera teardowns that you'll see uh, by a username Chicken. I put links to both those pages down in the description so you can get to them easily. And now I'd like to close this week with a reading from the good book. Issue 5, Story 7, Verse 1 by Joe Fitzpatrick. Dear Acolytes of Electricity, let us spend a moment remembering the daily struggles from a time before enlightenment. For let us not forget that there was a time that even the most modest system upgrade required a screwdriver. And let us recall the dark moments when we were alone with dip switches, not knowing what to set or where to seek divine guidance. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next week.